for being here. It's a, a real pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Joyce uh, uh, Father Fortune from uh, Smith College to our colloquium series. Um, she is basically the person behind this uh, two good program, an active learning environment uh, adapted to the Smith College units. And uh, in view of our uh, its recent interests and, and plans for the active uh, learning building uh, a room in the new uh, STEM building, we thought that we might want to uh, hear from from somebody who's actually <coughs> implemented this type of techniques as opposed to a, a PR researcher. And, uh, you know, um, I'm really grateful that she found the time to come. She, she has a very busy teaching schedule this semester, so, um, you know, I hope that um, this is going to be a very useful experience for all of us, I'm sure. Thank okay. you once again, and uh, the floor is yours. And I'll, I'll dim the lights a little bit. I don't know how Luke feels about that, but We're good. Can, I, can I dim the lights here? In this? We don't need to. No? We don't need to? Everything's good? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you can see I'm fine with those. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time and interest in, and, and coming today. Um, I uh, teach physics at, the Smith Co in, at Smith College, but I have to tell you in advance, I am not a physicist. I, all of my degrees are in electrical engineering. Uh, the, I only ever teach introductory physics. Uh, I may someday teach the electronics lab, but I'm an electrical engineer, so that might be okay. Um, so I, I, I'm very much 24-7 introphysics at Smith. I started as a lab instructor. Uh, when they needed to open up a new section, I got promoted to be a lecturer uh, back when we were still teaching in the traditional format. Uh, and, but all along, we had been keeping our eyes on trying to, to do uh, an integrated format, and we got our chance. So I tried to, I haven't given a professional talk in years. The last time I actually gave a professional talk was in 1994 in Japan. When I was finishing up my, my uh, postdoc work there, I was uh, six months pregnant, and, um, and in the next room over, um, oh, some people you may have heard from Nagoya University were showing off their brand new blue LED, so no one saw my talk at all. <laughs> uh, so it's been a little while, my slides are not particularly snazzy, but please interrupt at any time if you want to ask a question uh, about these. Um, so when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about, you know, back when we were using the traditional lecture plus lab format, um, you know, we felt, we always felt that there was a, a problem. And, and well, it's really a problem per se, just the usual intractable problems that we have in teaching introductory physics. Um, uh, we now refer to tri the traditional format as, as three naps and a very confusing afternoon. <laughs> because that, that's often what it came down to for students. Um, and our, the, the thing that was most troubling was that our student performance seemed to correlate very well with their experience prior to Smith. Now, I'm not saying that they didn't get anything out of taking physics at Smith. Um, that, and we had evidence that there, we were making gains. Um, we used uh, the force concept inventory, which you may be aware of. It's a, a concept test, though. It's not a, a mathematical or computational test. Um, that uh, we were looking at our numbers, though, and the, the numbers, it looked like students who came in with uh, good math skills and good physics scores on their FCI were doing great. And students who came in with, you know, less well-prepared were not making as good a gains. And I'll show you some of the data I have. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a physics education researcher, though. So uh, if you press me too much on the data, I will crumble. I try not to cry. Okay, but. But uh, I, I'm not an education researcher, and I, I did my best. I made graphs because I think that's a little bit more, um, reveals a little bit more about our data. So for, uh, we have, a, at the time when we were doing the traditional format, we had a, uh, a two-tiered system, and they were both calculus-based. But we gave students a math test on the way in the door. And uh, based on your, what you did on this math test, if you did well, you went into the Physics 117 class. And if you didn't do so well, you were encouraged to go to the Physics 115 class. So we had a two-tiered system. I generally taught the lower-tiered system. And the main difference was uh, the level of math we expected people to be familiar with. Um, we still expected them to take calculus, but uh, honestly, often it would be in my classroom when you got 
did your free body diagram and set up your Newton's second law equations and the x direction and the y direction. And you might get three equations, three unknowns. And the other class would stop there and say, you know how to solve that. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. right? In my classroom, we solved. We talked about substitution strategies and how you might solve this. Oh, when you see both sine and cosine, see if you can take a ratio. We, we would cover math at that level because we were getting students, as you I'm sure do, with all kinds of math levels that they're coming in at. So um, uh, all the instructors were uh, very up to date on using active learning in the traditional format, to the extent that you can. Uh, at asking people, pair up, ask a question, discuss it with your neighbor, uh, to the best you can in, in some of the lecture format. Okay? Um, so that's what we were doing. Uh, typically, though, we, oops, sorry, I meant to hit the, there we go. Typically, we were getting gains of about 50% in the course concept inventory, which is pretty good. Um, typical lectures in large universities were more like <coughs> a 25 to 30 range, uh, depending on how much energy people put into it. So we were doing okay, but clearly in the lower skills class, they weren't getting as much out of it as the people in the higher <coughs> skills class. And I've got the, I, I, I like to graph the data. I feel like I understand it better that way. So what I plotted here was uh, the gain in uh, absolute number of questions you got right. You may recall the FCI has 30 concept questions. So um, if they took the, score, took the test at the beginning, of the, of the semester, we were getting students who were coming in scoring close to 30, right? Sitting in the same classroom with students who were scoring down here in the single digits, okay? And I'm sure your students have to stay in that same uh, wide range. Um, but then what we would see is that we, we were kind of, you know, we had a lot of scatter. Some people got a lot out of our physics class, some people didn't. Um, I, I was not happy that this is so white. Here, that people who come in low weren't getting that high, although I'm kind of proud of those people who got up to, to 20. So that's kind of what our distribution looked like. Um, the other way to look at this, instead of looking at the absolute gain, um, you could look at the percentage gain. And that's what I plotted here. Uh, the percentage gain, that would mean take the, uh, uh, like if you got a score of 10, and you've got 20 is what you could gain. So what percentage of that <coughs> did you get? And of course, it's different. With, and so, depending on your pre-score in the traditional classroom, um, this to me looks like an ideal gas in a little box. You know, it, it, there's doesn't see. It looks like we have most of our students coming in around here. We have fewer students coming in up here. But it really, you know, how much people gain it just really looks like it's an ideal gas. Uh, if I actually go and look at averages and. I'm not always as impressed with averages, but after I look at a graph, I feel like I can, I can use some averages. Um, if you were in the lower tiered class, of course you were coming in with a lower score. It seemed to correlate with math skills. Um, and you uh, had higher absolute gains, but lower percentage gains. Okay? If I combine all of those students into one class, that's where I got the number of about 50%. So overall, if you looked at the whole program, we were getting gains of about 50% on the four spends of inventory. Um, but I was always disturbed by this. We were not really serving the students who needed serving more. Right? People who come in with less need more because when they're when they graduated from that class, they're going to need to know it as well as the students who are getting the high gains. They're going to need it for their engineering 270 class if they're going on to engineering. Um, and so I, I thought, you know. That's, this is something that had always bothered us. Um, and some people would look at that take same data and say, well, what's the problem? <laughs> and uh, to me, it's not so much in the numbers, because 46, that's still a pretty good FCI game. Um, students who are a lot arrive less prepared tend to um, get left behind. They drop out disproportionately. They uh, get lower grades, and they're really less prepared for those future courses. And that's something that we think a lot about. It's, if we're small enough that, that, that there's, there's really a face on that person. Um, and that person is sometimes in our offices. And, and we, just, we just want to help. Um, uh, simultaneously, they did some, some work with the interest to the, uh, uh, the office that takes care of data, which has a proper name that I can't recall. Uh, they surveyed the students uh, who were from underrepresented groups and asked them about their STEM classes, and one of the things they asked about was 
introductory classes, and their responses indicated that those intro classes, not just physics, are really seen as barriers. They're barrier. If you can't get through that, then you just go and go off to Division One, Division Two, and these are the very students we're working so hard to recruit and get into uh, into the STEM fields. So. Um, we had the occasion, and I think much like you were having the occasion, opportunity knocked on our door. Uh, some new space opened up in the chemistry building. Um, we got a new engineering building, and chemistry moved in with engineering, and left behind some, some nice big lab spaces. For us, a big lab space is the size of your small labs, <laughs> just for some idea, about a thousand square feet. Uh, we got a couple of new lab spaces. And there was money for renovation. Don't ask me how that happened. Uh, but we were, uh, we were able to get the old space renovated. Um, Smith has always had a very generous support for faculty development and site visits. And we had been talking for years and years about, oh, could we integrate this? What are people doing? So we had a pretty good idea of what the physics education research community was doing about this. So um, we uh, had a great willingness uh, on the part, part of the department to go to a kind of new format. And, but we knew we wanted to do it Smith style. And uh, so there'll be some, some differences between probably what you have planned. But I feel like, from what I've talked to people, we have a lot in common about what we're trying to accomplish. So I'm really glad uh, yeah, I got a chance to come here. Um, how we did it, as a practical matter, we tried to do as much learning from what other people had done as possible. Um, I personally, I made a couple visits to MIT. Um, RIT, my father used to be a professor there, so I had a foot in the door. Um, uh, RPI, uh, RPI was actually a study in, in how, how not to do it, and they were very frank about this. They, they said, look, you can come see our classrooms, but let me tell you if I had to do it over again, this is how I would do it. They had a, just a particular set of constraints that they had to deal with. Um, and, uh, and many people are not very happy with how their, their intro physics ended up. Um, uh, we went and took uh, some Chautauqua courses. Three of us went to Oregon to take a nice Chautauqua course where all the people who were doing the, 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 you know, the interactive in all formats uh, were getting together. We have had Priscilla Laws out for a beer on many, many, many occasions. <laughs> and she's been wonderful. She was really, really helpful in helping us get going. We went to lots of APT conferences and Gordon conferences. Um, and we reviewed a lot of material, um, like the, uh, the workshop physics books. Um, there's uh, another set that's put out by a lot of people in Washington. There's, uh, there's smart physics. Um, there's a number of things we looked at, and we didn't find anything that really fit our needs. Um, that fit our needs very well. Um, so we knew we were going to have to do something uh, kind of unique. Uh, we decided that we we're going to phase in the new format over the period of two years, because that's when they had the, the money actually committed, we knew we'd have two years to get into those spaces. Um, we started with intro two instead of intro one. Um, and that was in the year 2012, 2013, because we have smaller enrollments. It was just one section. Uh, it's sort of less risk. Let's do some learning on the students who are a little, uh, who are not just having their first introduction to physics. Um, and then the schedule was to go to intro one in 2013-14. Uh, that fall, we had two sections. And in the spring, we had three sections. So we were going to have to go from one professor teaching in this manner to uh, one, let's see, five altogether, yeah, five sections, although some of them were the same people. And um, we would have to also turn over the physics two to a different person because I was going to be going down to physics one, demotion to physics one, uh, to, because that, that's clearly where the action was going to be. I saw a couple of hands up in the back. Yes, sir. Number of students. Oh, uh, that's on the next slide, but the, it's capped at 28 per section. So it's fairly small. Yes? So you had one year where students did traditional intro physics one. Yes. And then... And some of those students came in and did... And did your intro two. In, uh, and did you do interviews with that year specifically about their personal reaction and the, yes. the direct comparison? Oh, I, uh, well, I surveyed them with the Survey Monkey, so it was anonymous. Um, and, and there were a couple of other th things related to the textbook that we surveyed them on as well. Yeah. Yes, that was, that was uh, an interesting group. And what did they have to say? If you get to it later, that's fine. But just Oh, okay. Um, students' reaction was, was actually quite positive um, in that sense. They, the people that had the, the, the two different formats um, really liked the 
problem-solving sessions. They liked those a lot, and they liked the chance to get up in the middle of the class and do things rather than having to sit all the time. That was the, the two biggest things that people mentioned about it, was that they didn't have any chance to fall asleep, although some people thought that was a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, in, uh, in addition, what I did was, um, I was, I was the faculty member here, uh, and I hired two summer students. I got support from the dean of the faculty to have two students work with me. We took our existing labs, which we loved. They were our own labs, our own lab manual, and everything. Um, we broke them down into some smaller exercises. But as with anything, when you clean out the closet, you end up tossing out some of your old stuff and developing, developing some new stuff. Um, and we went to town with the new sensors that Vernier offered and, and got to play with those a lot. Um, and we got to focus on, on intro two only for that summer with those two students. Um, unfortunately, one of them was graduating and the other one would, could not be in the classroom, so we didn't have uh, them working in the classroom. The following summer then it was slated that I would work with two students to break down the existing labs for physics one um, and do much the same, only add in whatever lessons we learned in 2012 were going to be incorporated. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we meet, we have 6.5 contact hours a week, which I don't know how that compares, but probably similar. It used to be divided up into one hour, ten minute, three times a week lectures, and then a three hour, fifty minute lab. Or sorry, two hour, fifty minute lab. So, roughly. If, if you turn off the Wi-Fi, it'll stop doing that. If I turn off the Wi-Fi. Okay, next time I will turn off the Wi-Fi. When I get to that. Um, we meet on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays for now, uh, one hour, 50 minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer to those as two-hour sessions. Um, where the lab and lecture are integrated, um, we meet, students come on either Tuesday or Thursday for a 50-minute problem-solving session uh, in the classrooms. There's 28 students per section and up to two student assistants. Uh, if I have a full section, I want to have two student assistants in there. Um, and if I don't have a full section, I might uh, cut back on student assistants. Um, one of the things that I thought was critical to how we did this was that our department had a very strong consensus on what needs to be covered in intro one and intro two. Okay, it's in a Google Doc and we can all go back and refer to it that we all agreed that this was going to be the content. Um, all of the intro classes, no matter who teaches them, has a daily homework and a weekly homework. They have three to four midterms and a final. So there was never any, oh, this professor's better because they don't give as many exams, or this professor's better because they don't give the, their homeworks harder or something. We were all on pretty much the same uh, wavelength when it came to what has got to be in this class, what the students really need to do to, to work in this class. Um, we uh, had the additional constraint on that the, student, the teachers will have to teach so that the labs happen on the same day in all of the sections. So this, the, the teachers really have to stay together. You can't afford to have one class getting too far behind another. Now, one day you can work with, right? Uh, it means one class might have to put up with equipment being out on the table that they don't use that day. But in general, they, they, we had to put a little bit of effort into keeping the classes together, um, which we would not have necessarily had to do in the lecture format. Um, but other than those restrictions, the instructors are otherwise free to be themselves. Right? But uh, we also kind of have a strong culture in our department of sharing. Um, uh, you know, at lunchtime, so often the conversation starts with, you know, I had this student who was having trouble with this. And then the whole lunchtime conversation is, is, is you know, the older faculty telling the younger faculty, or the younger faculty mentioning something, this is new, this is different. And so it, it, uh, maybe this is what I'm referring to when I say Smith style is that we, we understood our constraints very well, but we didn't want to muzzle anybody and say, you have to teach with the workshop physics, or you have to, you know, we don't want to tell people what they have to do. Um, because I think that's part of transmitting the, the happiness and joy that we feel when we think about physics is, is how we personally relate to it. And we don't want to suck that out of the intro class. We want that to be... Um, you know, and, and for some people it's very personal. For me, it's making sure every one of my students understands that a solar cell is a diode. And why does that make electrical energy? It's not creating electrons. And so so there's, there's the things that I'm really excited about, which are different than the things uh, that other people in the department are excited about. But whatever way we transmit that excitement to the students, that's, I think, an important thing to leave. Leave some
some leeway for people to be able to do that, um, which is going to be a very individual kind of thing. Um, this is a picture of our classroom taken in haste this morning. Um, this is one side of the classroom here. Uh, we have tables, there are two tables here that are uh, put together. Um, nominally, we have two people on each side, uh, and there are 12 of these tables. They're grouped together, so there's six groups of tables. Um, so students have a partner, and then they have a table. Um, in the back of the room, there's one screen. Um, I'm standing when I'm taking this picture in front of the other screen, which I'll see in another picture. So this is half the classroom. You can see there's boards all along the side here. There's boards behind that screen all along that sidewall. Um, I've got a table with uh, extra equipment we might need for labs and an occasional demo that they don't do at their own tables. Uh, we're set up for magnets. They've got little magnet kits. They've got current supply and Helmholtz coils. And you see all the magnets out in magnet probes. They were doing a, a, an exercise in looking at the shape of magnetic fields um, when I had class uh, yesterday. Um, uh, in fact, there's uh, was a nice thing. We have these uh, screens. So those, those summer students, they sewed screens for me. Those are spandex screens put on uh, little frames for, well, the biggest frames I could find for, uh, for doing uh, embroidery. Um, and they have little things thrown into them. So when I'm going to do the potential of a dipole, I have some students hold that and I make the potential of a dipole. When I want to make a capacitor, I get two little blocks of wood and I make a capacitor. And I've got a spandex sheet. And they all have spandex sheets. You can just barely see there's a stack of them up here on the shelves. Uh, and I have them do that. And they were, I can't do that in a lecture. I can't imagine trying to explain how to think of potential as the height of a flexible sheet without having a flexible sheet anymore. Um, and I get the big one because, well, because I'm the instructor. I get the big one. They got smaller ones. Um, that's, uh, that's the other side of the classroom. Um, the each station has a computer, as you can see there. Uh, and again, boards on the other side. Uh, when we do electrostatics, everybody gets their own. Each pair has a Van de Graaff generator. Uh, I love those hand crank Van de Graaff generators. All right, so you're telling me I should um, get out of Wi-Fi. So I'll just turn the Wi-Fi off. OK. And then I can go back to slideshow. All right, well, hopefully that will work for the rest of the day. OK. Um, let's scooch up. Where were we? Uh, we were just doing the pictures. And then in the front, I have a double smart board. Um, we, we had gone to the Teal classrooms at MIT, and they have, that, that, they have a really wonderful setup, but it was never going to fit in this room. So we uh, compromised uh, what's on one screen is actually projected in the back of the room. Uh, and then the previous slide goes over here. So people do have to turn their necks around if they want to see what was on the previous slide um, as, I, as I go through. Then um, day to day, uh, any particular class, this, I think you can imagine this is a mixture of little short lectures, no less than 10 minutes, we try to keep it. Too many questions, um, discuss and report questions. I really like to be able to tell my students, give them a meaty question, a conceptual question, and say, okay, think about that for a minute. Then talk to your partner. Then talk to your table. When your table is happy with your answer, go draw it on the board. And so everybody's got their board space, and it's really quick to see around the room who gets it, or if nobody gets it, what is the problem? And it's very easy for me, with that kind of feedback, to go in and say, oh, clearly I need to amend, I need to add a slide here, we need to talk about this concept or that concept. Or, nobody needs to talk about that, let's move on. Um, so it, it, it's providing me with feedback, and that's one of the things I really appreciate about teaching in this kind of a classroom is that I get some really immediate and really, well, if I ask a good question, I get a good answer, right? So depending on, on what kind of a question I ask, I can get really, really good feedback on, on what, we, what we need to talk about, what we don't. Um, almost every day there's a lab exercise. Um, this has turned out to be the thing that's really, really popular with the students. Um, I almost never now do an example for them. And when I first started, I thought, oh, I'll do an example first and then let them do one of the boards. I now skip that. I skip that completely. Because they really don't learn anything from me doing a problem with the board. And it took me a while. 
before I really internalized that. Um, and just the other day I was talking to the, uh, the physics teacher at Northampton High School who was a Smith alum, um, and somebody asked her, but, but don't you do example problems? This is somebody who was still kind of stuck in, in the mentality of lecturing. Don't you want to do those example problems? She said, I took a survey in my class. They don't want me to do any problems. They want to actually get to work on the problems because they know that's when they learn it. And I, was, I felt really validated by that. But it's what I really saw in my classroom, that there, was, there wasn't any difference in their performance at the board. They still got stuck at the same places, whether I did an example first or not. So why waste any time? Let them get to the board. That's where they're going to do the learning. Uh, and they've really responded well to that. Everyone's set up in pairs. You're never sending one person alone to perform or help for other people. You're always actively engaged. And then, of course, this will vary day by day, as you might expect. Some topics are um, more conducive to board problems. Some is better to have lots of lab exercises. Um, one of the things that made this possible for us is that we decided to make all of our intro resources available to everybody. And uh, we do this. Uh, we put lesson plans, the in-class questions, lab exercises, any related files, the lab handouts. Uh, the uh, homework assignments and solutions and problem sets and solutions and everything is on a server that everyone has access to. So when I go from teaching physics two this semester to teaching physics one next semester, the woman who's teaching physics two will have all of my slides. She'll have the updated lab sheets with spellings corrected and such, uh, and any updates because the equipment changes a little bit each semester. Um, She'll have everything up to date on that server. She'll complete access to it. Uh, when she looks at my slides and says, oh, why did you change that problem? Then we, it's very quick for me to be able to hand over to her any updates, things that I changed. Why did I change it? Oh, that didn't actually work. You should change it back. That sort of thing. Uh, so it helps with continuity in having that course um, you know, really uh, not be a big burden on someone who's taking it up uh, as a new course. Okay. Uh, we also have a common Moodle site. Um, not every instructor uses There's one instructor who really likes how their Moodle site was before. Well, she uses her own Moodle site. But she goes to this Moodle site to pull resources because uh, videos and applets that people find, really good links, um, the, the, uh, the, you know, the list of homework problems, even things like that can be really nicely stored in, uh, on a Moodle site and transferred over to the current semester's site. Um, and what this really did for me was it, it helped us have a reason to talk to each other more about our intro physics. So when we got a new person in the department um, in the fall of 14, he stepped into this. He had all of my slides from the previous semester. And he often used them. Um, but often, an hour before class, he'd be down in my office and say, why did you use this example? And it gave us a really great way to start a conversation about, oh, because he hadn't ever taught before. Well, this is the kind of problem that I've seen before, and this is why I put this problem in there. And he could get a little bit of insight from me, which, honestly, I got from Gary, and Gary got from whoever he got it from. Um, and it was a way for us to, maybe in an organized way, hand down some of our experience to each other. I had gotten so many good two-minute questions out of working with uh, uh, one of the other new faculty members, someone who came with lots of experience, she had some really awesome two-minute questions. I got to steal from her, too. So it's not always a one-way street. Um, uh, and especially for someone like me, an electrical engineer trying to teach physics, a little bit intimidating, right? Um, but uh, getting everyone else's perspective is really, really marvelous. Okay? Now, we were told to expect student resistance, um, especially Priscilla Laws um, gave us the you're going to get student resistance because the students don't feel like you're teaching unless you're lecturing, right? Um, and uh, so initially, the students really don't know what to expect. So anything that they don't like about the class is now the fault of the new format, okay? And that, I, I don't know how much you can do about that. The students will still complain about the workload and the exams even in the new format. Um, but what we did at Mont Priscilla's advice was to, we really facilitated the buy-in on the part of the students, okay? Um, I completely read out the first day of class for that first year because nobody knew what we were doing, not chemistry, not math, not anybody. And, and I just revamped it and said, look, this is why we're doing it. I pulled out the physics education research stuff and said, this is why we're going to, and don't expect to come to class and sleep. 
you know, expect that I'm going to censure the board, expect that I'm going to discuss things, expect that you have to do the reading, because you won't be able to discuss things if you didn't do the reading, and just get them to buy into that. And I think, um, well, you might think that Smith students are like of some ethereal quality. I would argue our students are probably not as different as you think. Um, when I appeal to the better nature of my students, it generally works pretty well. And this, I feel like, is appealing to their better nature. You're going to learn this better, and physics education research shows it. And uh, the, the story I often tell my students is, you know, when I took physics at University of Texas with 300 guys and me and two other women, um, I didn't have anybody to work problems with. And I spent a lot of time in office hours and so on. So I happened to make it through. But I spent a lot of time not getting problems done in my room at night and staying up late and again wasting my time. Uh, and I tell them, you are going to have that same experience. You are going to get stuck on a problem. But you're going to get stuck on a problem right here at my whiteboard. And you're going to have somebody with you doing the problem, and I'm going to be in the room. So when you get stuck, you're not going to spend three hours banging your head against the wall. You're going to get the problem done. And that was really effective in getting the buy-in, especially since all of my students are, are women. And in our society, women are not expected to do well in physics. And that, even though we're a women's college, that carries into our classrooms. You know, that, that uh, unconscious bias is, is in the air. That's how Claude Steele puts it. So that I found to be really effective. And I have also found things that are effective with women students are effective with male students. I think male students don't always show, but I think they would also buy into something like that. Um, at any rate, we were also told to expect faculty assistance. Um, now, we had gotten our faculty buy-in in advance, and we built in a lot of uh, freedom and flexibility, so we didn't have a tremendous uh, amount of, of problem here. However, this is something that I think you will all notice. Um, faculty like to lecture is what we're used to. Even when we know it's not that effective. And I don't know the number of times that I have caught Gary Felder walking out of his class going, I just should have shut up and let him get to the boards because I have just I just I talked and talked and talked and talked and they didn't have enough time to do this and it, I felt like I had to cover something uh, if I didn't say it then somehow they wouldn't know it um, and 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 we have to kind of let go of that that's and that was kind of hard because it's what we're used to uh, and we're used to people learning it when we speak it um, and so that's that's a little different. Um, they didn't tell us that we would need a catchy acronym, though. And so here I was, summer 2012, trying to get ready for the fall of 2012, and trying to make that Moodle site that everyone's going to rely on. And um, I needed a catchy, I needed to say, what is about this physics that's different? And I did not want to have anything that had I-L-L in it, right? <laughs> physics L. Who wants to do anything? You've got to call it Like, if it were up to me, and you guys can use Phil, OK? If it were up to me, I am not a wordsmith. I'm, there's a reason I'm an electrical engineer and not an English major. Um, we do have two faculty members, though. Uh, well, one who's has from a liberal arts background, uh, and the other who's from India, where they really know English. And they came up with our, with our acronyms. Uh, this is a cut and paste right from my Moodle site. Um, we accented the coordinated observations and lectures. Right? We were trying to get the lab integrated with the lectures, but we were also trying to create a collaboratively oriented learning environment. So that's where ours came from. Our physics at Smith is now too cool. We have coffee mugs. We have uh, uh, water bottles. We have little teddy bears that have this written on their t-shirt. And I think we're going to have to go to baseball hats soon for, with these. So the uh, learning assistants in the classroom get those as a, a little gift at the end of the semester. Okay, so, so you will have to work on a catchy acronym, but you've got, what, a couple of years before this is going to happen, so I think you're, you, you've got time to work on that. Um, so in our inaugural year, I should mention, we did not have student helpers. I had non-student helpers in the classroom. We just got a new lab supervisor who had a master's in physics and was uh, given part of his job was to teach at least one lab. So he was in my classroom, uh, and his wife, who had come to the area, didn't have a job, needed something on her resume. So she came in and as a volunteer and, and helped out in the classroom. She now is employed full-time as a physics teacher at the Chinese Immersion Charter School in Hadley, Massachusetts. 
Um, and so she said it. She's done, she's done very well, but she was only going to be there for a semester. Uh, my second semester, I had the faculty member who was going to be taking over in the classroom. Um, I was the least experienced teacher in my department. I had only eight years of experience teaching. And I, was ha I had the most experienced teacher at Smith College uh, in my department as my assistant. This one. <laughs> uh, I found that quite ironic. Um, occasionally, we had some student volunteers come in as class assistants, and that was actually very revealing. Um, one of the things that had been revealed was we realized we're going to need to train our student assistants uh, really well. And that's going to be an important thing that you'll have to think about, too. Um, so well, some of the things we learned, students really like the active classroom. They like to be able to get up. They like to be able to talk to each other. They like being, especially getting up at the boards, they said that was the most helpful thing, was having that time built in to do problems at the board and have someone there to ask questions of. That was really important. Um, they still complained about the workload because we really didn't change the workload. They still had homeworks to do. They still had daily assignments. They still had exams. Um, the uh, lab was integrated in, but you still had to do the labs. So, so the workload, we, we were very careful to try and not increase the workload. It was the same, but they'd been complaining about that all along. Uh, we learned a lot of practical lessons in uh, classroom management. Uh, for example, if there's a lab exercise, I try to put that on the second half of class. Because if I put it in the first half of class, people always end at different times. And it's really hard to get the class kind of back together, skirting back in. So it's much better to put a lab exercise toward the end. Uh, it's so hard to predict how long the lab exercise is going to take, though. And it always takes longer than you think it will, um, is the other thing um, on the practical lessons. Um, now, in our second year, we had only student helpers in the classroom. Um, and we got some uh, advice from a very well-timed phys tech conference that happened uh, uh, in conjunction with the March APS meeting in uh, 2013. Um, they had someone there from Colorado talking about learning assistants and their learning assistant program. And they had people from other colleges who had kind of spawned programs based on theirs, in particular someone from uh, Seattle Pacific University whose program was about the same size as ours. So uh, I got lots of practical advice on how to set up uh, a, a program for, for Smith and not drive myself crazy, because it was really taking that on as an overload. Um, they basically, we, so we told the students, um, uh, you are need to take a special two credit course if you're going to work in our classroom. And for that two credit course, you're going to do some weekly readings and we'll discuss them, and they're on education-related topics. For example, we, uh, I have them read uh, Reddish, Reddish's paper, the 1987 or 88 paper where he talks about models for learning physics. Uh, and he takes what would otherwise be very jargony uh, education research and made it a little bit more readable for uh, someone who's learning physics. Um, uh, and, but we do things like mindset. Um, we, I have them read a bit of uh, uh, Wisdom Vivaldi. Uh, to talk about stereotype threat. Um, I had them at some point take the implicit association, uh, and sorry, implicit bias test um, that you may have heard about where people, uh, association, you can test people's association between say women and science and find that most people don't associate women with science. Um, although for Smith College students there were a few that had a very strong association with women and science. That was very nice to see. So we talked about some things that don't necessarily seem to be about education, but they're very much related to every day in the classroom. When you're at the board with a student who's having trouble, um, what is the nature of her trouble? Um, it could be things that are completely beyond your control. So how do you approach that? And, uh, and, and that's they've been very, very nice um, to have those, be able to have those discussions with students about how to do things better in the classroom. The students also have a weekly meeting with the instructors of whatever section they're and that meeting is mostly spent on talking about these are the topics coming up. Here's the lab equipment we're going to use. Refamiliarize yourself with that. Get um, uh, you know here. Run through the experiment once uh, because you're going to be the one who has to debug it if something's going wrong. Um, and we do our best to tell them everything we think can go wrong, but something else might go wrong. Right? Um, we also give them some written materials. Um, I give my students uh, in-class problems and the problem-solving session problems so that they can go home try some of those out, see if they really remember it. Um, and that's part of their course credit, to be prepared for class. Um, they, however, all of their contact time with students is paid for money. 
Uh, they're not volunteers in the classroom, and that's, that's not for credit. If they want to, they could do this for credit. I've never had a student who wanted to. They all wanted the cappuccino money or whatever they want to put it towards. Um, and, and I think that works out better. People are much quicker to, to drop something when they're a volunteer than if it's a paid job. Um, the biggest lesson learned when we did intro one was that we actually needed to teach more of the lab analysis in the classroom than we expected. And apparently we were actually doing a lot of that in the lab. So when we broke down those labs, we didn't actually budget enough time to talk about error analysis and curve fitting and things like that. Um, I don't know what it will be, but I, my, my guess is there'll be something like that. And at the end of the first year, you're going to say, oh, we really didn't budget well for this or that or the other. And then and you'll make adjustments. We certainly have. Um, the one thing we also noticed that the people who had been lab instructors had a much easier time trans, um, t uh, moving into these new classrooms. Uh, the very first semester, both of the people who were running Intro 1 had been lab instructors in recent rotations to the labs. And when something went wrong, we were both completely prepared. Uh, and it was very smooth. And in the second semester, it was me and two theorists who had not been in the Intro 1 lab rotation in a while. Now, they'd done Intro 2 labs. Um, and they were in that rotation instead. So they were really, really happy that I had been a lab instructor for five years already. <laughs> and, and that was something that we now knew to tell people to expect. So when the new guy came in, we said, you're going to have to sink some time into getting familiar with the lab equipment. Um, because if you hadn't done the labs recently, you really have to, to know those very well. Okay? And, and, and that, was, uh, that was an interesting thing to learn. Um, there was, uh, as you can imagine, some faculty want to cooperate a lot, others do not. Uh, one of those semesters, all three decided to work together. Um, and I happened to be one of the three. We did, all sections had the same homework, we had the same exams. Um, we had uh, the same problem solving sessions. Uh, actually, students tended to cross those anyway. Um, so I only had to prepare one out of three homework assignments each semester. I only had to prepare one third of the questions for an exam. I really felt like I was getting, they used me for the lab questions, and they did a much better job at asking really good other questions. Yes? So you have a site. You don't even prepare anything. Oh, 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 well, yeah, because, oh, yeah, well, it's like the spring semester starts on a Thursday instead of on a Monday. So, the, yeah, so, so yeah, each time you, you, putting them together is very easy if you have all these resources. Um, so, so, yes, you can pull things together. and So each semester the homework is a little bit different from a previous semester. Um, but yes, that was really great. The time we invested in putting that together. It made putting that homework together really well, uh, really easy. And then I could just, I'd run it by the other instructors and they might catch something. For example, uh, occasionally they'd say, look, I really want to use that as an in-class question instead. Oh, okay, let's take that out and pull out another one. And it was very easy to coordinate among the sections that way. And it, I felt like for the first time the intro load went down by having it in, uh, in this format. It was very uh, nice. Um, and I got to work with two really great colleagues with whom I hadn't really been able to work that closely before. Um, uh, not, uh, not all faculty want to do that. But we, we leave that as a possibility. Um, so now here's the question. Do we have any evidence that this is better than a traditional format? So um, this first graph is the one I showed you earlier. This is the FCI gain in absolute number uh, versus your original score. Of course, the people who start out with a high score can't gain that much. They didn't get that many wrong to start with. Um, uh, and this is uh, so. This is our, our traditional. In the two cool format, I feel like there's something different here, and I feel like the difference is up here. I had somebody who scored zero zero walking in the door who scored 21 on the way out the door. I have never had that happen. I had a couple of students who scored six. These two students were in my section. And these were students who, if, I, if you'd ask me in the lecture format, it's just going to drop because it's going to get too hard. Um, and and my, my anecdote is that as I'm walking around the room when they're doing problems, when they're having discussions, I can catch that person before they get far off track. Okay, I can see on the board that they don't understand something. And either one of my assistants would help, or I could go over and chat with them. 
It's really easy to catch problems before they become really big problems. Uh, and I think that kind of explains this effect where I, I feel like, I feel like this data is better. Now, I better do some numerics on it as well. Um, but let's look at the data in the other way by looking at the percentage gains. So the percentage gains, this is my ideal gas in a box. Now, I feel like this gas is starting to condense up here in the upper left corner a little bit. I feel like that's a little higher. Um, so I ran a few numbers. Um, and uh, what I have here, uh, this first three rows of data is what I showed you before. Um, the pretest scores, the post-test scores for our separated classes, the one with the lower math requirement and the higher math requirement, where the people who came in with better math were getting better gains than the people who came in with a lower math score. Um, when we went to the two pool format, our gains went up for, for well, for, well, not only for the whole class, but this is the whole class put together. We did not separate one section out to have a lower math or another section at higher. Everybody was in there together. So you could ask, if everybody's in there together, oh, maybe this is really 70% for the students who already know things, and still 40% for the people who don't. Um, so what I did with the data is this. Um, oh, um, so th this is just explaining what I was feeling before. Um, that having the faculty and the student assistants there made it easier for us to keep students who would fall behind from falling behind. Um, <coughs> so here's the thing, if that's really the case, we should see greater gains among the people who are getting the lowest pre-score. Um, and uh, the student assistants, I think that's a repeat. Let's go right to the data. Uh, the top one is for people who had uh, a pre-class score of less than 10. I just clicked into three. Um, and if you were in my Physics 115 class, um, that meant you, on average, they had a score of around seven. Um, they had a pretty good gain, right? But still, that's only 43%. Um, those same students in the two full classroom went up to 60. Okay? Now, uh, the, the numbers may seem smaller here when I separated those classes. And that's why I put N over here. These are kind of smaller numbers. Uh, but 47, that's about half of the students who came in on that particular year. We're in this category of pre-class scores of more than 10. Um, if you were at the other end, if you're pre, uh, before you took physics, you were still scoring in the 20s, um, you still had a game in the 60s. Slightly higher. I don't know if that's statistically significant. Um, but there's a lot fewer students who are in this range. So I think for these high scores, the really high scores, N is, is, is a factor. Uh, I think this one is really interesting. Um, because this was the lower math required physics class. What we found sometimes, we can only ask students to voluntarily go. We give them a math test. You did really good in this math test. You should go in this other class. But some students really just wanted to have an easier grade. Those were the students <coughs> that wanted an easier grade, even though they could have taken the other class. And I think they may have gained more. They would have had to work harder. These are the students who didn't want to work very hard. So, uh, but I've only got N equals three here. I don't have a lot of students who were in my, my uh, lower math level course uh, to begin with. So, and in the middle, as you can imagine, things are kind of in the middle. Actually, the middle group seemed to fare pretty well. Uh, they were doing pretty well under the old regime, but those gains, those gains in the 60s are across all levels. And that, to me, is, is it, that's as good as I can get to validate my ANIC data, which is to say we're serving that bottom end of the class better in this format. And I think the mechanism, I don't have any data to show, I think the mechanism is because we're, our eyes and ears are right there when they're struggling, and we can actually do something about it. We can actually understand that, oh, nobody really know. They answered that clicker question great, but no, they don't really understand potential, or they don't really understand the sense that. That's what I think is going on, and this is all the data I will ever take because I'm not a physics education researcher. I'm a practitioner. I want to just apply what people do uh, in my room. Um, so my last thoughts on this is that uh, I think it's Smith. The too cool classroom is really energizing and 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 uh, and activating our intro physics classes. It's been a really positive experience overall. Uh, we're seeing some measurable gains in the FCI, which is a limited use in, in some ways. It doesn't measure quantitative uh, data or anything like that, the ability to solve a problem quantitatively, but it measures something. 
Um, we find that our students are now demanding other departments to use more active learning. I don't know how many engineering students have come to my office and said, God, I wish they would come over here and learn how you guys are doing this because they, they're, they're falling asleep in their engineering lectures. And I'm so proud when they hear that. Um, our in-class assistant program is getting a lot of really good attention across the college. A lot of humanities are coming over to ask about in-class assistants and why do you do this? Because it's very foreign to them. I'm going to have lunch with someone in chemistry again next week because they think they might want to have their in-class assistants do something like this. Uh, another geologist said, hey, can we have lunch next week? Um, they're, they're, they're noticing that, that there's, a, there's an enthusiasm out there for the intro physics courses that was never there before. Um, and, we, and, our, and our LAs and our students are our best advertisements. Um, we, I think we, we got over that initial student resistance, I think largely because our LAs are saying, yeah, but you know how much better you're learning this physics than you would have otherwise. And, and, I, and I know students who would have definitely dropped out if they hadn't been in a classroom that was supportive uh, on, the, on the lower end. Okay. We have also seen a recent bump in physics majors. We are up to double digits for the year when we started in the intro one classroom. Those, that would be the, the students who are juniors now were the first group to be in our intro one to cool format. Um, and we are up to 10 majors now, 10 declared majors. Um, and, uh, for the year that's to follow that, the students who are sophomores now, we're already up to nine and they're not done declaring yet. So there's, there's something tangible that's happening. I'd like to take complete credit for it, of course. Uh, I know I can't because I, I have to, at this point, thank all, all of my colleagues who have been incredibly supportive. Um, I did take the lead on much of this, but um, I was in everyone's office uh, getting their help, getting their support, getting their advice uh, on, on how to make this actually work really well. And I got incredible support from our administration. They sent me to so many conferences over that five-year period. Um, that was, uh, it was really absolutely great. So I feel like now, by coming here, having not given a talk in 20-something years, um, I'm able to get back a little bit to that community. Um, and, and I think you guys have something awesome going on here. I heard that in some years, you have, <coughs> among your 10 plus or minus majors, that sometimes you have 50% women. <coughs> Way to go, University of Vermont. You guys are awesome. Uh, keep up the great work. I love the, uh, the, the nursery. It was great. Uh, I saw on the fifth floor those tables out in the hallway. That's where I learned my physics. It was in a table in the hallway outside my professor's office. Um, you guys are doing a lot of great things here. And I, um, I wish you the best of luck. And I'm happy to take any questions you have if I didn't answer them in here. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Kevin. One uh, thing that... Uh, deans and administrators look at is the DFW rate, these Fs and withdrawals. Uh -huh. How has the two cool physics affected the oh, rate? Um, Do you know? Uh, well, there, there, there will always be students determined to get enough. Um, sure. But I, uh, I would have to go look. I haven't actually given out a D in two or three semesters. And there used to be, like, there's always one or two of those. Um, uh, one thing some students are very uh, attentive to are their grades. And if it looks like they're going to fail, often students will drop out. Um, uh, but even so, there, there have usually been somebody who gets a D or somebody who gets an F in the past. I think the last, I think four semesters ago, I remember there was a student who got a D. Uh, determined to get a D. She really was. Um, but but I, I feel like that ratio has gone down, but I don't have the data to show it. That would be an interesting statistic for me to, to, to get, and it shouldn't be too hard for me to get that statistic. One more question. Sure. Uh, the labs that they do, is mm -hmm. there like a lab report that they have to write, or they just do the activity and then that's it? Oh, okay. Uh, for most of the lab activities in Physics 1, uh, the data analysis do, is due as a homework problem. Um, so, for example, the kinematics lab where with constant velocity and constant acceleration, where you analyze the graphs and the slope and that, that's, that's been turned into a homework problem um, so that those skills still uh, factor in. Um, there are a couple of labs where 
kind of the data is too much to be worth just one homework problem. Um, and what we're starting to do with those is have those as separate lab projects. So then you do a more detailed analysis of that problem. Uh, and that's, uh, let's see, this year in Physics 2, uh, those lab projects are 10% of your grade. And uh, in Physics 1, we're going to start trying that in the, um, in the next semester. Um, there's, in Physics 1, most of the labs really do break down very nicely. There's one lab that has been sort of too much, and I think we're going to take that and make it like a single lab project. Maybe that would be worth 10%, 5%, I don't know, of the, of the grade. So, so that was one of the things when we were integrating the lab, and I sort of feel like the first time around, we didn't probably do it that well. Some of those problems were really too big to be homework problems. Um, but now that we've had a little bit of experience, that's one thing we've tried that seems to be working reasonably. Well. And Matt had his hand up. Yeah. I have three questions actually. Okay. Going in order. Um, this last point, you said the bump in physics majors now up to double digits. What's the baseline? What was your? Oh, um, well, we uh, tend to have uh, over time an average of about six. Okay. And in the last few years, we've had actually less than six for like six years running, and we couldn't figure out for the longest time what the problem was. Um, but we just kept on plugging away at it uh, and. Uh, and so we're, it, it could be something else. It could be that financial aid is trying to get more STEM majors, and that's why we got more people interested in physics who are here. I, I don't really know, I can't, and it's hard to separate out what the admissions office is doing. Um, but I, I feel like I should take some credit here. <laughs> we'll see over time, right, as we, if we keep this, as we keep this format, there was no plan to go back. But uh, we'll see if that double digits actually, actually sticks. Uh, the next question is, when you, you said that the students look forward to the time at the board and then they can get direct help from you or the LAs, when you engage them at the board, what's the style of engagement? Is it more Socratic or, and if so... Oh, it's very Socratic. How do, you, how do you train the LAs in that art? Because that's that's probably engagement. the hardest thing for, for, for the LAs to learn because I think that's something that takes us a long time to learn. Uh, and then the first thing we really have to train them is you're not here to give them the answer. You're not here to check and see if they got the right number. So when someone says, did I do this right? I tell them, the first thing you should ask them, I mean, you can't tell them looking at it if they did it right, right? Who can do that in 10 seconds? Maybe some of you can, but I can't. So the first thing is, walk me through how you set this up. Uh, and, and there, we, that gives me, and certainly our LA's a chance to do things like, well, why don't you label the velocity on your graph, on, your, on the thing here? And, and um, now, when you said delta s, I'm not sure what that is, because there's many distances on problems, and many times people will put the wrong distance in. Um, are you sure you have acceleration in the x direction? Because this is projectile motion. Or, and and so sometimes we, that, they, need, they just need a little hint. But if someone just wants to check a problem, the stock answer is, walk me through what you've done. Um, and we, uh, we have a, a, oh, actually part of their grade is a, is a four-step problem-solving framework. Um, so on exams, they are expected to show, write down the key ideas, draw a visualization, which is labeled with the same symbols that they use in the formulas that they use to solve the problem. And on a certain number of those, they need to assess it. And we're not talking about the assessments that they put in at night. And we tell them right after that, night does not assess the problems. They usually write, that makes sense. <laughs> you can write that after any problem, and yeah. even whether it makes sense or not. Um, and for us, an, uh, an assessment means a meaningful comparison and a justification. So this bullet I calculated is going 33 uh, meters per second. Well, 33 meters per second, what's that in miles per hour? Let's see, that's the two point, uh, the factor of two, right? That's 60 miles an hour. Well, cars can go 60 miles an hour, and I'm pretty sure if I shot a gun at a car going 60 miles an hour, I could kill the driver. So I think my answer might be wrong, because I don't think bullets should just be going 60 miles an hour. That's an assessment. Um, making a meaningful comparison. And students, that's the part they, that's the other thing they complain about assessments. You make a student's assessments. And do you know how many seniors I've had come in my office and say, I am so glad you made us do assessments. <laughs> and and they, they won't say it when they're in their class. But they said, that was the most important thing I learned in your physics class, was how to do assessments, how to think of something meaningful to compare my answer to. Um, uh, so, so when they're at the boards, that's the thing I'm picking out. Because um, that's, that's going to help their problem-solving skills when they're doing something more uh, uh, 
well, more complicated than projectile motion. If they can draw and label a figure about projectile motion, then I'm not worried about them going to CERN and doing particle physics because I think they're going to label that one too. And they can understand what they're doing, what each step is. So that's. I have one more quick question. Sure. On the graphs of the force concept inventory. Yeah, should I put those up? Yeah, put one back up. Uh, you want this one or the? No, the other one. Yeah. I, I noticed the vertical ac axis conspicuously stops at zero. <laughs> oh, yeah. There are, um, in, in most, this is about 100 students. Yeah. There are three points that are underneath here. Okay. Some students are determined not to learn. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, so I, so I didn't put them on this graph, um, but there are three for each of those graphs where the student came in and but, got yeah. a lower score. Afterwards than they did before. Does, does the where they start correspond to the lower score? Because if you start higher, you have more yeah. potential to go down. Like on the oh, on the. Well, there's only three on each graph. Yeah. Are they? So, um, and there's also the the idea that at the end of the semester, some of these students are like, I don't want to take this test. Well, somebody doesn't take the post test. I take them out. Yeah. Right. They need both pre and post to do this. Um, and some people will just go through and say, okay, a a a a a. Um, you know, and, and that's not a particularly valid result either. So since there are so few of them, I didn't feel bad about leaving them off the bottom of this graph. And I don't remember where they fell in the, uh, in the X direction. But I have that on my computer so we could look it up afterwards. I was just wanna, curious. If you want to see, I'd be interested now that you've asked the question. Great, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Um, what is uh, typical class average and what is the percentage of A's and the B's? Oh, uh, though that has varied um, a bit. Uh, my classes tend to have mostly A's, B's, and C's. And there have been, some, sometimes I'll get a phenomenal class where it's half A's and half B's. And I don't feel bad about giving, doing that if the students have really earned it. Um, we have a, there's a rubric, I don't know if rubric's the right word for that. You know, if you get 93 or above, that's an A. 90 to 93 is a a plus and so on. Smith College has one of those. And we tell people up front, that's what we're going to use. And this exam is going to be this percent and so on. Um, so it's very easy for students to tell where they stand um, and you know, know when they have to work harder. But it, you know, if everybody works hard and gets 100 on the exam, I'm going to be a Molly's. And I'm very upfront about that because they're not going to be competing with each other. I want them working together because they're not going to call me at 2 in the morning when they can't do a problem. They're going to call that person they got to know around the table who was actually pretty good at explaining those things to me. Geez, maybe I can call her up and see if she got number 36. Um, so so that I, that's, that's the other, another part of our philosophy. We don't curve grades. Uh, and there have been semesters where it's more like a third, a third, a third, or like a third, a half, a sixth. <laughs> so there, there are some semesters where where I, I've got a group, because my numbers aren't that big, right? My maximum section size is about 28. So, so it varies a bit. But sometimes I've, I've had a couple of really awesome classes. Uh, yes, sir, and then? Two quick logistic questions, one kind of meta question. So the students work in pairs. Do you pair them? Did they pair themselves? Oh, well, um, I let them pair themselves. Um, like, for example, class starts on Monday this semester. Monday, they sat wherever they wanted to. And then Wednesday, they sat wherever they wanted to. And every Friday, I have Mix It Up Friday. And you have to go sit at a table with someone you don't know. Um, so they get to know each other in the classroom. Uh, especially the Physics 2 classroom. I have first years, I have seniors. I have all kinds of students who have no other way of knowing each other. Um, and I, I think it, in some respects, if I don't push them, they won't necessarily get to know each other. Um, that's something I, I kind of got more appreciation for with our learning assistants. So one of our learning assistants um, came up with a project, get to a project at the end of this learning assistance course, and uh, she wants to come up with some in-class exercises during the problem-solving sessions such that people will do more community building so that they'll feel like they have more friends in that class, that they're in this together. And that's the thing that really um, helps them be able to call the other person in the middle of the night, or maybe not in the middle of the night, but at, at least uh, at a time when I'm not available. Um, so that's something that, uh, that has been um, helpful in my class. Another instructor who didn't do that, he's saying he wishes he did that. But, so th we talk about it at lunch, right? 
Uh, so, you know, this, oh, I'm having trouble with this group of students. You know, these two, they, they don't understand anything and they won't sit with anyone else. And, and I tell them, you need to mix it up Friday. <laughs> and, uh, and, some, and sometimes that will work with a group that needs to be busted up and sometimes it won't. Sometimes people are determined to be in a group that's not very healthy. Um, and you had one other question or? Two other. Um, so you do lab experiments towards the end of the lab, or towards the end of the two-hour block? Towards the end. Uh, if it's a real like lab, something where they've got to take measurements. And if it's a little hands-on thing, like with the magnets. Oh, I had them have, hold those magnet probes and figuring out the magnetic field of things while we talked about other questions. And they can play with that stuff at the table. So are you leaving the equipment on the table all day? Or yes, I'm leaving so it all day. So they're not packing it up, they're not setting it out, it's set up for them. Um, Yes, they don't have to pa un unpack it, correct. Okay. Yeah, we have a lab supervisor and he has a few helpers who, man, they get in on Tuesday, Thursday, and then Friday afternoons to change out any equipment that needs to be changed for the next class. So, but we, we own that room and uh, nobody else has to go in there for another yeah. lab. And then a, a, a bigger level question. Um, you have an engineering background, you mm. don't have different tiers, so you get the pre-meds, you get the yeah, music majors, you get the engineers. Yeah, we got the variety, don't we? Can you talk about, do you see one group of students appreciate this more? So you did based on force concept inventory, but in terms of majors, do the engineers particularly benefit from this format? Do the Oh my god, do they ever. Oh. Um, well, partly because the engineers tend to take it as first years. Um, my pre-help students, they have the freedom to put it off until sophomore, junior years, even senior years, some of them. But they don't really want to take an intro course as a senior. So, don't normally look at them as, as sophomores or juniors. But most of the engineers take it when they're first year. And that's when they're not used to college yet. They don't necessarily have the study skills. Maybe they never had to study in high school because they got into Smith after all. They were. And then, so they're, they're really dealing with lots of, of you know, learning issues. Um, and to be in a classroom where you're forced to get to know each other and then feel the benefit of that right away, that's been really great, I think, for them. And sometimes they were, they were the biggest group down there at the low end sometimes. <coughs> uh, people with the lower math skills, but they really, really wanted to do something. We'll put them in an environment where they can actually get the help they need right when they need it. Um, that was really beneficial, I think, to them. Um, the pre-health students are often more mature. Um, and not that they were necessarily scoring off the charts all the time, um, but I th I'm thinking of a particular student who, uh, who she really, really worked hard, a chemistry student, and she did it awesome in this format. I think she would have got lost in a lecture. Um, it does mean that when I do examples in class um, and when I do explanations, I have to talk about chemistry sometimes. I have to talk about engineering sometimes. I can't take all my examples from electrical engineering. Um, and uh, my chemistry majors, they all perk up when I say, this is like something you saw in chemistry. So if I can make a diode sound like chemistry, they're like, now they're interested in solar cells. <laughs> And, uh, and I, I see some, some laughs, so you know how to make a dialogue it's not like chemistry, it sounds like. I think I skipped you earlier. You mentioned that uh, in the too cool uh, format, uh, the students had homework that was due every day. Was yeah, a, small, a short daily assignment. A yeah. small one, yeah. right. Was that true in the traditional format? Yes. Okay. Yes, that was true in the traditional format as well. And a second question. Did you... Uh, analyze the students' uh, backgrounds who were the in the less prepared group. What I'm trying to get at is that uh, is the less preparedness uh, a result of uh, secondary school deficiencies or is it associated with the uh, either uh, attitude or uh, Mm, um, yeah. Lack of smarts. Uh, yeah, I don't have any, any real data on that. Um, I think probably um, I, we do notice that um, the underrepresented groups on campus, the first generation students, the students of color, uh, the students who didn't have good high school classes, who didn't have a pre-calc or a calc class in their high school, are definitely at a disadvantage. Um, and I think they can get, if they want the help, they can get it in this format in a way that they couldn't in a lecture. You can still be determined to fail, <laughs> but if you actually want to learn this and, and want to work hard, uh, I mean, it's still, it's still hard work if you want to, to really learn this well. 
Um, but I think your work pays off a little better when you're uh, when you're not as prepared in this format than it might in other formats. And I've got no data to back that up. It's just my anecdata. data. It's just what I think. So I've been trying to, to use this Socratic method in, in the classroom where we mm -hmm. use the solving problems together on the, mm -hmm. on the whiteboard as a group. It's still not in individual mm -hmm. groups yeah. yet. Yeah. But um, one of the problems that I'm facing is they're asking solutions for everything after the fact. They want to see the solutions of the problems even the ones that we discussed in great length in class that we presumably all together reach mm. a conclusion, right? Yeah. So they constantly ask for solutions. How did you solve that problem if you encounter it? Mm. Um, oh, yeah. Well, I t tend to post the solutions of things we've done in class anyway, because if you're, in, especially in the active classroom, you might not have enough time to take down all the notes. And we just did that problem, but I, uh, I really want to take a look at that again, is what I hear from students. So I, I take them at their word that that's really what they want to do, and I'll post a solution. I mean, a post a solution isn't the same thing as working it out together in class. Um, but um, uh, another thing that I often do is I actually record what we're doing. It can record the computer screen and, and my voice. And some of the parts are boring when I'm walking around the room watching people at the board. Um, but some students have said, you know, that really helped me when I went to go do this homework. And I remember we talked about it in class, but I didn't understand my notes um, to have that resource. Only a few students use it, though. Um, but the ones who use it really appreciate it. So that, that's, the, that's the other thing I'm And the to homework do. solutions? Do homework solutions after get posted after they're, after they're turned in. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's, of course, you can always, I'd say, cheat on the homework. You know, if someone has solutions from last year, you could copy those down. Uh, but the homework doesn't count that much. This year, I made it only 5% of the grade in physics, too. Uh, because if you cheat on that, you're not going to get anywhere on the exams. Um, and, uh, and the exams are a much, much higher percentage of the grade. That's the other thing. The whole department is on board with that. That, uh, that, this, that homeworks are for feedback. Homeworks are for you figuring out if you understand how to do the problems we're going to ask you on an exam. Um, and, and exams need to be somewhere around 60% of the course's grade. Now, some people it's 55, some people it's 65, but it's all around that range. Um, and uh, labs need to be a certain percentage and so on. So. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, we can thank Joyce again. And... <laughs> all welcome to 91 and 10 down uh, 91 uh, in Massachusetts. Uh,